Yeah, hello. Uh, my name is Tanja Lassau. I'm a PhD student at the Hamburg University of Technology. And this project on pacemaker artifact removal for CT data is a collaborative work of researchers from Philips and also clinicians from the University Medical Center in Hamburg. So before I will uh, yeah, start with our approach, which we call DIPAR, let's first have a look at existing uh, typical approaches for metal artifact reduction and why these common methods are not uh, applicable for our case of pacemaker artifact reduction. So we will start in the projection domain with the input raw projection data. And the first step is a reconstruction of an initial image volume. And you can see in this image these typical streak-shaped and uh, shading artifacts caused by the implanted metal. And yeah, the neighboring anatomy is not really good visible. That's why we would like to remove such artifacts. And in common metal artifact reduction pipelines, the next step is a segmentation of the metal in the image domain. When we do now a forward projection, we can identify line integrals, which are metal affected in the projection domain. And these are treated as missing data, so we can perform an in-painting to yield a metal-free sinogram. And when we do now a reconstruction, we obtain a corrected CT image without metal and without metal artifacts, and can re then reinsert the metal based on our metal-only CT image, which we obtained in the step two of this pipeline. So what is the problem here? The problem is that due to this step, that means the metal segmentation in the image domain, we implicitly assume that the object is static. And this is not the case for cardiac CT. So what happens when we bring motion into the pipeline? We will start again in the projection domain. So here you can see uh, one projection view um, of a clinical case with implanted pacemaker. And due to the cardiac motion, metal positions are well defined in each projection view, but not consistent in time. So when we now perform the reconstruction of an image volume, all these motion states are mixed together, and you can see that we have a combination of metal and motion artifacts. And this is a critical point, because when we now do the next step of metal segmentation, we suffer from two problems. The first problem is that due to the cardiac motion blur, Hounsfield units might get below the segmentation threshold, so that we result in incomplete metal mask. And the other problem is that, for example, here at the electrode, um, object sizes might also be increased by the range of the motion when it's a really high, uh, high density object. So when we now follow the rest of the pipeline, you can see that the predicted metal shadow really mismatches from the real one. And after in-painting and reconstruction, the result looks even worse than the uncorrected one. So yeah, these approaches are not applicable. What are the alternatives? Um, yeah, in the literature, there are just few research papers dealing with moving metal artifact reduction. And the first paper from Toftegard et al. proposed to perform the metal segmentation directly in the projection domain. So you can be independent of this 3D motion blur. And this is proposed for um, cylindrical gold mar markers, like also from uh, Hahn et al. They also proposed a method for uh, gold mar marker artifact removals. And they suggest to perform first an image-based metal segmentation. And when we now do a forward projection, we determine the coarse metal shadow mask, which is then in the next step refined by exploiting the edge information in our projection data. So what can we learn from these approaches is that one should not trust the reconstructed image data, but that we can trust our raw projection data. And therefore, we defined three targets on our um, artifact reduction pipeline. The first one is that it should work completely raw data based. The next one is that it should also be applicable to ECG gated and ungated CT scans. And in contrast to the existing approaches, it should also be robust regarding low deviations of metal shadows and background line integrals. So how is the existing pipeline adapted? 
Instead of performing this detour over the image domain, we want to directly perform the metal shadow segmentation. And this is where the machine learning comes in. So we train convolutional neural networks to perform this metal shadow segmentation. And the resulting um, outputs are then post-processed by thresholding and largest connected component extraction so that we obtain a binary in painting mask. In this first shot, we just uh, perform distance weighted linear interpolation as our in painting strategy. And uh, for the reconstruction, we applied filter back projection, um, either ECG gated or ungated, depending on the data. So the main uh, point of this pipeline is indeed the training of our convolutional neural networks. And in contrast to typical supervised learning approaches, we do not use manually annotated data. Instead of this, um, we developed a forward model which introduces synthetic pacemaker leads into clinical cases without metal. And this data generation pipe pipeline relies on two types of clinical input data. The first type is called the reference data which has pacemakers implanted and which are just used to extract lead positions and pathways with respect to the cardiac anatomy. And based on this knowledge, we can then create our synthetic pacemaker model and can, re, uh, can insert it into our target cases. So how is it done in detail? We first start with a model-based segmentation of the heart and we perform a manual selection of at least 10 B-spline knots along each pacemaker lead. These B-spline knots are transformed from our reference cases into the target image geometry by also performing a model-based heart segmentation, and then we can exploit the point-to-point uh, -point correspondences in the heart meshes to perform a simple spline smoothing. Now we have these beam spline knots in our target image geometry and um, can do a beam spline interpolation and also a dilation to yield the um, binary image volume with synthetic pacemakers. And this binary mask of um, yeah, metal is forward projected to yield the corresponding metal shadow. Now we can uh, add our original metal free projection data to our synthetic metal shadow and get the input which is required for our neural network training. And the corresponding target lab labels are obtained by just thresholding our forward projected synthetic leads. Yeah, this uh, pipeline is applied two times per reference case as we got um, yeah, 14 target cases available and seven reference cases. In total, we have a huge amount of label data because each case corresponds to a relatively high number of line integrals. And this data is case-wise separated into uh, the subsets for training, validation, and testing with respect to the corresponding reference cases because we wanted to ensure that the background line integrals and also the um, pacemaker geometries are disjoint among these subsets. Yeah, now we have our data and can perform supervised learning. Um, in the first step, we uh, sample patches, multiple patches along the projection views and use them as input. So we adapted the existing uh, unit architecture for these multi-slice inputs. And as we always search for the same line-shaped structures, um, the weights in the contracting path are shared. The information are then um, joined in the bottleneck so that we also exploit the temporal and angular information. And in the expanding path, only the center slice, which should be segmented, is copied and cropped. Yeah, we perform a patch-based uh, training because uh, the data is highly imbalanced and reinforces that 75% of the training patches contain at least one object voxel and we also use the focal loss which is well suited for imbalanced problems. Yeah, here you can see some uh, quantitative results on the data with synthetic leads 
And we made the observation that for the final image quality, uh, false negatives are more severe than false positives. So we really focus on the sensitivity and therefore also chose a relatively low threshold of 0 0.15 for our thresholding. So what happens uh, when we apply our approach on real clinical data? We collected eight cases with real pacemakers and also checked our pipeline on two cases with, um, yeah, without pacemaker but with severe calcifications with a stand and sternal steel wires. And you can see in the top row um, some projection views of different cases and below the corresponding segmentation results. The first thing that is really promising is that despite of the lack of dedicated learning data, um, the foreground background separation also holds for the electrodes and also for defibrillator leads. Another thing which is a little bit surprising is that the networks are really strong in um, differentiating between ECG leads, like here in case three, and our pacemaker leads. And this is quite hard because in a single view, it's nearly impossible to, to differentiate between both. And the networks seem also to um, exploit the temporal information, so the uh, rotation velocities of the ECG leads in contrast to the pacemaker leads. This is not so good for um, ECG case, uh, leads which are horizontally aligned because here it's hard to get the uh, yeah, rotation velocity. And we also have some false positives at the spine here and at the sternal steel wires. But as I already mentioned, uh, these false positives are not so bad compared to false negatives. And in the image domain, you can see that um, artifacts are significantly reduced. So in the top row, you can see the original data without any artifact removal below our approach. And yeah, at the bottom, for comparison, this uh, image-based segmentation approach. And you can see that for comparison, this image-based uh, approach has sometimes really introduced uh, severe artifacts also, when it's, when it's working quite good, you see that um, the area of blurring is increased compared to our approach, and sometimes the leads are not completely removed. So to sum up, um, we developed a forward model for the uh, introduction of synthetic pacemaker leads, which also ensures sensible insertion positions and uh, lead pathways. And we trained convolution neural networks based on this synthetic data. And uh, these networks now can perform a metal shadow segmentation directly in the projection domain so that we are independent of 3D motion blur. And we also tested the generalization capabilities to clinical cases with real pacemakers and also with different contrast and scan, scan protocols. Yeah, we found um, the results quite promising and made some more research in this direction. We improved the existing pipeline by two main adaptations. The first one is that we also trained a network for deep learning based metal shadow, segment, uh, metal shadow in painting and also a deep learning based metal reinsertion. And you can see here some results before and after our improved pipeline, which yeah, significantly reduce artifacts and also reinsert the metal at reliable positions. Yeah, thank you. So we have time for questions for Tanya. Any, any questions? Thank you. Nice work. Um, my question is the following. You mentioned this quickly that uh, you had this issue with the ECG lead. Um, so from a clinical practice perspective, uh, ICU patients have many 
uh, metal objects, such as ECMO catheters, uh, ventricular assist devices, uh, port catheters, uh, all kinds of additional uh, material that is actually uh, either implanted or uh, inserted. So when you, have you checked your network now that was only trained on pacemaker leads for metal detection in these real world cases? Yeah, we just checked these two cases with the sternal steel wires and yeah, these are uh, false positively identified as pacemaker leads. Um, the stands were not identified as metal implants, so yeah, it really depends on the metal object and whether it's a line shaped structure, I think. So is the selection and the focusing only on the pacemaker leads, not kind of a, a narrowing of the, the model. Uh, would it be better to create a more generic model that uh, would include most of the implants and inserted catheters that we can see in clinical practice? I mean, the forward model itself uh, for the data generation is also adaptable for other types of metal implants. Um, yeah, so far we just focused on pacemaker leads, but it's also possible to, for example, um, perform a metal forward model for uh, artificial valves or metal clips, something like that, yeah. Might be interesting to see whether we would have to train a model for each of these or whether there or would be some one. generalization capability of your networks. Uh, okay, thank you. Yeah. Other questions? We still have time for a few questions. Okay, maybe I can go ahead with, uh, with one question or two. Uh, so the model involves, uh, <laughs> sorry. So, so the model involves uh, quite a, a quite large number of hyperparameters. Can you, can you comment a little bit on this? Uh, how, how you dealt with this? That there, is, there are choices in the projections, in the choice of patches, maybe in the CNN ensemble, so. Um. Yeah, we made the observation that especially um, the number of projection views which we include is crucial because first we just started to segment based on one projection view and the results were quite bad. So it is really necessary to include several um, projection views. And also, uh, the receptive field size is crucial. Okay, all right. So, okay. Hi, thank you for your talk. Mm, I was wondering about your um, uh, patch selection strategy. So, you talked about uh, 11 uh, slices and uh, uh, sp uh, specific uh, size of the patches. Yeah. Can you comment a little bit more about uh, what your strategy and uh, what have you, how you decided on these dimensions for your patch stack? You mean uh, th this patch yeah. sampling strategy that 75% of the training cases have at least one object voxel? No, more, more about like uh, 100 by 100 by 11. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, we just um, tried several sizes and uh, we made the observation that a larger patch size is good because we also need a large receptor field size. And um, on the other hand side, uh, the height of the detector array is just 128. So we cannot increase it to a yeah, really, really large uh, patch size. And this is a middle way, so 100 times 100 works good in practice. All right, gotcha. So probably follow-up question. Have you did any data augmentation of these patches? No. All right. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Um, I was wondering the masks that are uh, extrapolated by the network are uh, binary. I'm understanding, right? Um, is it like a black and white uh, as written down there? No, at the beginning it's uh, like a probability map and oh, you can see it for map. example here at the electrode that the intensity is a little lower. Oh, right. 
third. So then, uh, never mind then. Because I was wondering if it's okay. a binary, it seems like a very strong decision, but uh, in fact, it's deciding how much of an impact the metal has on the actual value in the, in the image then, right? Yeah. Maybe we still have some time, so maybe I can follow up with another question. Um, so uh, the problem seems to be highly unbalanced, and uh, you mentioned focal loss. Did you try other losses, maybe, that are uh, often used in, in yeah. images? We also uh, tried the generalized dice loss and also a combination of sensitivity and specificity loss. But yeah, both works worse than the focal loss.